welcome Edwards, Bruce. Uh, welcome everybody, all the mediators and lawyers from uh, Uganda, from Kenya, from Tanzania, and some of them I'm sure they are from South and Sudan. Thank you for availing yourself for this webinar. Uh, we usually have our monthly webinars and last time we had on sports mediation. Our main focus this month is on mediation advocacy. Mediation advocacy is, uh, I'm sure people will ask, there are people asking themselves, uh, me a question that uh, whether it's just purely for the lawyers only, but anyway, it's good for everybody who is available to attend because we are trying also to find the position of the lawyers within our practice in mediation. Now we have caught an expedition across the East Africa. We have caught an expedition in Kampala, in Nairobi, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, though we have different rules that govern uh, those three places, I think that representing your client in a mediation session, I think is, uh, is the same thing all over, even I think in the US. So everybody will benefit. And I'm not saying only lawyers, even those who are non-lawyers, but who represent their clients like companies in a mediation sessions. There's a lot you can gain from this uh, presentation today. Um, uh, Bruce Edwards is a specialist. He, he understands the subject very well. And I'm sure if we listen to him very well, there's a lot we'll learn today in preparation for a comprehensive training that will follow. So, We'll give him time to present himself for the next 35, 40, 45 minutes. And then at the end of it, at the tail end, you can ask your questions. At the same time, we have a question and answers by uh, patterns uh, down there, all our chat section. Please put your question there so that at least when we start, we, we begin taking questions. Already we'll have had some of them in the, the chat section or in the question and answer section. So with that, Thank you very much for availing yourself today. I think I will invite uh, Bruce to introduce himself and proceed with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I appreciate uh, everyone's attention this evening. Those of you from the Law Society of Kenya, the Uganda Law Society, Tanz uh, Tanzania, uh, South Sudan, just a great group of people tonight. And I appreciate the chance to speak with you about this important topic of how lawyers can succeed in mediation. Um, I'm Bruce Edwards. I'm a lawyer by training. In fact, this year is my 40th anniversary of being a member of the California Bar Association. So when I speak to you about a lawyer's role in mediation, I assure you that I appreciate uh, uh, many of the thoughts that you have coming into tonight's conversation. Um, but more than being a lawyer, uh, I'm a mediator. And about 35 years ago, in the early stages of my practice, I thought there was a better way of trying to resolve disputes than uh, the ones our civil justice system allowed my clients to proceed through. And <clears throat> over the course of several years, experimented and developed this process of mediation <clears throat> um, and have since gone on to mediate every day for the last 30 some years, over 7,000 disputes of all different types, working with countless lawyers, training hundreds if not thousands of mediators, <clears throat> and more recently trying to help train lawyers in how to succeed in this mediation process. So as James said, do uh, contemplate questions, do prepare those, we'll be, leave plenty of time at the end to try and address those. I do think it's important to start uh, by understanding why uh, this conversation is necessary, if not critical. And I've worked with a psych psychotherapist in teaching mediators in Europe for the past dozen or more years. And he's taught me to help people understand the why before people engage in the learning on how to. And hopefully in the weeks and months ahead and the seminars ahead, there'll be plenty of time to train the how to. Today, tonight, I want you to understand the why behind this course and this conversation. First and foremost, lawyers are a critical stakeholder group in any mediation process. <clears throat> this is not about replacing lawyers. This is about preparing lawyers to more effectively participate in their representation of clients. Um, the company that I work for, the largest in the United States, we'll talk about in a few moments, uh, but um, despite our success and our size, there are quite literally 
hundreds of law firms throughout the United States that uh, after 30 years of mediation uh, in the United States are still very successful representing clients and much larger than my own company. Law is alive and well in the United States. The role for lawyers uh, uh, persists and the importance of training lawyers uh, in this new frontier of client representation is all the more important. So why is this? Why are lawyers such a critical stakeholder group? Well, in 2018, there was a grand experiment that was uh, contemplated and organized and run by a group of mediators uh, out of Switzerland. And it was uh, an opportunity cities worldwide simultaneously over the course of a year. It was called the Global Pound Conference. And the idea was to bring together mediators, lawyers, clients, and try and make some assessments, almost a snapshot in time about what was going on in the world of mediation. What did clients want? What do mediators think about the process? And a number of standardized questions. And as it relates to clients, clients wanted a more efficient process uh, when they were involved in disputes. They wanted more collaboration with their attorneys, their chosen counsel. They wanted opportunities to repair relationships uh, when uh, the opportunity arose. And they essentially were describing a process of mediation. And that was true not just in the United States, but throughout the world, this is the kind of thing that clients were asked after. Um, it's, it's what lawyers want. It's, we many of us came to this profession uh, because we wanted to help people. We wanted to help clients. We wanted to help people sometimes in the more desperate and troubling times of their lives. And we went to law school and went through years of training to be able to perfect those skills and, and bring that kind of, of resolution. <clears throat> and um, when I would go in the early stages of my career to law schools to talk to law students, and I would go to law firms to train young lawyers, and I would say, how many of you want to go be a litigation advocate? How many of you want to forcefully represent your clients in a courtroom or an arbitration proceeding? And most of the people in the room, their hands would go up because that for them was the quintessential vision of representing clients. And indeed for decades, if not hundreds of years, depending on your country, that was how law was practiced. And that was how lawyers practiced their craft. And yet over time, things have shifted. And we now know, for example, using the United States as an example, that in the last 25 years, there continues to be an erosion in the opportunity for lawyers to represent their clients in a court tribunal or a court hearing. I wrote a blog on it earlier this year about the vanishing jury trial, because in the United States, we still use jurors. And in our federal court system, it is important to note that less than 1% of cases that come to the federal court system result in a jury trial, less than 1%. That means over 99% of cases are going to be like mediation. In fact, this article that I quoted, quoted mediation is one of the main reasons that those case uh, and court opportunities are dwindling. Um, so it is important to know that the opportunity for young lawyers to forcefully extends well beyond the courtroom. It extends into arbitration. And now in the past several decades, it has begun to extend into the world of mediation. And, and as I told you, being a mediator every day since the pandemic started a year and a half ago, mediating every day on a Zoom platform or a virtual platform, um, I see firsthand the skills that lawyers bring to the mediation table and what they do well and what they could do better. And so this whole um, Edwards Mediation Academy platform that uh, my wife and business partner Susan Edwards uh, runs uh, is designed to offer not just mediation skills for those who want to be mediators, but mediation advocacy training for those lawyers who want to better understand how to succeed in the mediation process. What is going on within the world of mediation in other countries? Uh, Kenya is not alone. Kenya is but one of dozens and dozens of countries who are experiencing mediation and the growth of mediation. One doesn't have to look too far beyond your continent to see examples of successful programs in action. 
James and I have been together in Rwanda, for example, uh, where I've been four different times. Susan and I have worked with uh, training judges and lawyers on mediation skills, and more recently on becoming effective mediation advocates. We may now have trained more than 25% of the Rwandan Bar Association on how to effectively participate in mediation. We've probably trained an equal percentage of the judiciary training judges on how to maximize this process within the court system. Our recent courses on uh, mediation include uh, the, the prior uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, most recently the current Supreme Court Justice and Minister of Justice and ministers of other departments within the highest levels of government have all participated in mediation training, such as the draw, such as the appeal of the mediation process for many. Uh, likewise, in Zambia, we've completed several courses now uh, with uh, a cohort groups of uh, judges uh, and mediators, soon to move into the world of mediation advocacy training for lawyers. Uh, we have uh, friends who are training uh, this week in Ghana, uh, and uh, so it goes. Uh, South Africa has experienced a significant amount of mediation training. Um, when you look beyond the continent, uh, mediation um, training and mediation advocacy training is in full swing in countries like Brazil and India and Turkey. Um, from Peru to the Republic of Georgia to Austria to Canada to to uh, Mexico. Uh, these are all countries where there are active and ongoing mediation training programs where we're trying to bring lawyers and, into the process to help educate them about their effective role and the need for their uh, effective participation uh, on behalf of their clients. Um, in the United States, uh, where I can speak uh, most directly, Mediation has been underway for the last 30 years or so in the world of commercial disputes. Um, right from property disputes, uh, real estate disputes, construction issues ranging from single family and single building constructions to the tallest high rises in New York City or Las Vegas or San Francisco, uh, to public works projects involving dams and roadways and airports, uh, to environmental problems, uh, uh, to personal injury and wrongful death cases. Whatever finds its way into the court system, for the most part, has been um, successfully resolved through this mediation process. And again, it has only been successful because lawyers have learned to participate meaningfully, appropriately, and successfully within this process. But now we're at a stage where our courts in the United States don't let cases go to trial unless they've been mediated first. There are court annexed mediation programs available through most courts at all levels, from trial courts to appellate courts within the United States. Um, as I mentioned already, my company, the largest uh, in the United States, uh, called JAMS, we mediated successfully about 15,000 disputes last year in our 26 offices. Uh, around the country. Uh, and this year, uh, uh, with the vast majority of those being on a virtual platform. So uh, mediation is alive and well. As I said already, uh, if you measured our gross productivity, uh, as is often the case in the United States on the Forbes list of 200 top law firms, uh, my mediation company would rank probably 195th meaning the vast majority of large law firms are still alive and well and prospering in the United States, finding ways to use mediation as a tool uh, to help their clients, but not to supplant lawyers and not to supplant the important role of courts uh, and trials when needed. So what is mediation? I know we throw the term around. Many of you have been trained as mediators. You probably have a very good understanding of it already. I think about mediation a little differently than some, so I think it's important to start with some uh, definitions. In my mind, there's really three key characteristics to a mediation process. Uh, the first is that it is an interest-based process. It is designed to uh, ferret out and understand the interests of the parties. In many instances, the interests and needs that gave rise to the conflict, the dispute, and thereby provides us key insight 
into what it will take to resolve the conflict when we get to that stage of the process. Yes, absolutely, there is a role for law and facts and the kinds of things that we're trained for as lawyers to understand, but it's broader than that. And it extends to this concept of interests and needs and the human element of the dispute. Uh, and to that end, that's the first important characteristics of the mediation process. Uh, the second characteristic is what I call the right of self-determination. What do I mean by that? I mean that our, it allows the clients to participate in the mediation process, to be involved in listening to the other side, in expressing themselves, in ultimately understanding and selecting the, dis the dispute resolution um, uh, uh, solution uh, that is most uh, agreeable to them and most important uh, to them as it may impact the uh, rest of their lives. And I don't know about you all, but my experience was as a young lawyer, I would go to the courthouse with my client. My client would be asked to sit outside the courtroom, sometimes uh, in the, the hallway on a hard wooden bench, sometimes in the back of the courtroom, when the lawyers would be asked to come into the private offices of the judge. And very briefly, the judge would have looked at our mediation, I mean, our mandatory settlement conference statements, and told us what to do, told us what they needed our clients to be convinced of. And we would go out into the hallway or the courtroom and speak privately with our clients, try and convince them that the ideas they had coming into the courthouse needed to be let go, and they somehow needed to follow the judge's instruction. And again, I don't speak for any of you, but my clients found that to be a very unsatisfactory process, one they had no participation in and couldn't understand. And so this idea that we've designed a mediation process that includes your clients, that asks them to participate, that you, helps you manage their uh, messaging and <clears throat> opportunity to ferret out creative solutions, and ultimately to help them weigh their options and choose between them, is central to the mediation process, and hence its second characteristic. And the final characteristic of mediation really is, has to do with emotions, the welcoming of authentic emotions. I think one of the things we've learned in the last 20 plus years in the world of neurobiology is that emotions have a central place uh, in our uh, processing of information, uh, how we perceive the world around us, uh, how we interpret messages, even how we code memories are all tied inextricably to emotions. And while it used to be the case that we talked as lawyers about leaving emotions outside the courtroom, and it was always about the facts and the law, I think a much more uh, holistic and sophisticated view of conflict brings us to the conclusion that emotions have a central role in causing disputes and therefore should have a central role in the resolution. <clears throat> so. Um, mediation is so successful. Those of you who are mediators know this firsthand. How is it that a dispute that has gone on for years or months can be resolved in a single day? Well, it's because it allows us to address conflict consistent with how conflict begins by addressing the human dimension uh, along with the facts and the law. And along the way, again, as most of you know already, mediation has attributes that make it very uh, enticing to clients. That's why clients in the Global Pound Conference expressed such an interest in the process. It saves them money. It saves them time. It helps repair relationships. It returns you as lawyers to the core of the profession as problem solvers. For a host of reasons, mediation has proven itself time and again to be extraordinarily effective. I just read uh, an article this week uh, or in, uh, regarding uh, the experience you all have had in uh, uh, Kenya um, uh, with mediation in the court annex processes. And it reports that about 50% of cases that go through mediation uh, are successful. Uh, that number is a little lower than what we experience in the United States, but still an extraordinary success rate for, for people that come into a process on any given day with an opportunity to help their clients put an end to their conflict, put an end to their personal suffering, and to be able to move on with their lives. So um, mediation, we know to be tremendously successful. And along the way, it shouldn't be overlooked that mediation helps improve access to justice. It improves access to justice in two meaningful ways. The first is in the dispute itself, 
It allows parties to discuss and vent and talk about what's happened to them and feel like they have achieved justice, however that's defined. It isn't always defined by the law. It may be defined by how they or their family or their community perceive justice. It could be an apology in certain circumstances. And for them, that's justice in the moment. In a broader sense, mediation assists access to justice because by removing, in your instance, 50% of the cases from the court system, from the docket, it opens up the court system and frees the court system and judges to deal with those conflicts that need a trial and where you're lawyers and you need to get precedent. So you have precedent for subsequent cases. The courts are freer to provide that important service. So at a variety of levels, mediation uh, provides uh, better access to justice. Let's talk for a few minutes about um, mediation advocacy and what it is you do need to know to succeed in mediation. And here, I'm fond of telling people uh, the danger in life lies in um, not knowing what you don't know, not knowing what you don't know. Mediation advocacy is um, different than litigation and arbitration advocacy in fundamental ways. Again, I'm speaking to an audience of lawyers, so I realize that this is understood by all of you. <clears throat> but in making presentations to a judge or an arbitration panel, you're making a decision with the idea of winning, with the idea of convincing that tribunal or that judge that he or she <clears throat> needs to rule in your favor. It's a zero-sum game, winner take all, all or nothing, <clears throat> most likely. Yet mediation is different, and mediation requires a different mindset because your audience in mediation is the other side. Your audience is not the mediator in terms of persuading him or her of the righteousness and strength of your position. It's really trying to work with the other side in ways that are not, um, try, that are not winner take all, that are not off-putting. Um, it really is, um, you still want to win, uh, but it's just winning is defined differently, winning is approached differently, and to get there requires different skills. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, as you'll find out in a few minutes and later in, in subsequent deeper trainings, it's really about uh, learning to listen in a different way, learning to listen to identify interests. Uh, it's about looking for ways to collaboratively problem solve. Uh, it's about trying to be creative, learning how to effectively negotiate to accomplish your client's objectives and to achieve a desired outcome but all of that done under the watchful eye and guidance of a trained mediator. Um, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, not of a commercial case, but of a sort of a political solution that sort of identifies this different mindset, what we call the mediation advocates mindset. And uh, uh, a friend and colleague, uh, William Urey, who wrote the book, Get to Yes, and, uh, one of the seminal uh, professors of mediation in the world at Harvard University, uh, spoke to James and I and others at the International Academy of Mediators in Scotland years ago and talked about his experience in mediating a dispute that had been 30 years in the making, this uh, dispute in Colombia between the government of Colombia and the rebels known as FARC. And he talked about his first meeting with the government and how they were going to approach a negotiation with this rebel group. And he said, the first thing we need to do is understand the rebel leadership and who they're going to go back and report to and what it's going to require for them in the final instance to get approval to any kind of negotiated settlement they might bring back. In essence, Bill Urey said, we've got to help them build a golden bridge back to their constituents that has a potential uh, a successful outcome. And in that moment, he was defining a mediator's mindset or a mediation advocate mindset of how do you envision what the other side needs and try and figure out if it's possible to work collaboratively with them uh, in a different manner than you're used to, in a, man, a manner different from winner take all, let's uh, uh, fight until we win, which obviously hadn't served either of those sides well over the last 30 years through the loss of countless thousands of lives, the expenditure of tens of millions of dollars and just general strife within society. And this process was successful, as many of you may know, just from uh, uh, reading the press. 
Um, Susan Edwards and I and James uh, through uh, MTI East Africa, there's other programs for uh, mediation advocacy training. I'm just going to give you a couple ideas on what a mediation advocate thinks about and how it's different than your typical litigation and arbitration advocacy skills. Because in some instances, your skills are transferable. As lawyers, you've learned a lot and you're well on your way toward representing clients in mediation. Yet there are subtle differences. There are important new skills to be learned. And in some instances, I hate to say it, we have to retrain ourselves away from skills that serve us well in the <clears throat> traditional uh, litigation environment. Um, I'll give you some examples on, on sort of both fronts. Uh, <clears throat> and just so you know, it is so different are the skills that in many not many, but a number of law firms in the United States, there are mediation advocacy specialists, departments of lawyers that specialize in advocating for clients in the mediation context, who will sit in with litigation advocates and clients in a mediation process and help affect the skills necessary to succeed in the mediation process. But what are some of those skills? Uh, some of those skills include uh, emotional intelligence, uh, understanding sort of your own um, emotional competency and your own ability to navigate in an environment of difficult emotional issues. Um, you must be open to your own client's emotions. You must be open to expressions of emotions by those on the other side and realize that they have a place in the conversation, that they're not to be discounted, but in sometimes in those moments of the highest emotion, the truths that underlie that dispute are laid bare and you as a mediation advocate get a glimpse of what the interests are that may provide the key to unlocking the door to settlement. Uh, as a mediation advocate, you're gonna be asked to develop a completely different set of listening skills. As distinct from your litigation advocacy skills, you're not listening for a legal analysis. You're not listening to reply to each and every point, <coughs> almost as a debate. <coughs> uh, you're not mentally uh, tuning out the other side as you prepare a checklist of responses. Instead, you are listening. Uh, you're listening uh, maybe for the first time because your client has only shared with you one perspective, albeit an important perspective on the dispute. But maybe now for the first time, you're hearing an important and uniquely different perspective. <clears throat> um, you're, you're listening with empathy. You're listening with compassion. You're listening to try and connect with the other side's attorney and client if possible, because in so doing, you'll be able to advance the interests of your own client in that ensuing negotiation. You're gonna learn uh, about different kinds of questions. You know, as lawyers, we sometimes confuse questioning with cross-examination, asking questions to which we think we know the answers that are designed to uh, force the other side to confront the difficult truth or moment in the dispute. And yes, that's an important part of questioning, but it's only one sliver uh, uh, of the uh, uh, full pie of possibilities of types of questions. We will train you in asking hypothetical questions, asking clarifying question, questions, uh, asking reflective questions, uh, particularly asking open-ended questions, how and when you use different kinds of questions, again, to sort of build trust, to build connection, to elicit interests, all of this is a very important part of relearning communication and ultimately becoming an effective mediation advocate. <clears throat> um, I think um, effective mediation advocacy includes learning how to be trustworthy, uh, both with the mediator and the other side, not taking positions that strain credibility, but instead admitting uh, uh, weaknesses in one's position while trying to espouse the strengths uh, of your position can only build credibility and help in those moments when you really need the other side to, uh, uh, to uh, understand and agree with you. Um, being prepared for the mediation process. I think um, um, one of the things that I've learned over the last 30 years is that lawyers are trained to spare no time and expense preparing for a litigation moment or to prepare for an arbitration. Yet when it comes to mediation, sometimes people think that all they need is a good night's sleep, that all they need is their skills that have served them well in other formats to show up on that day with a trained mediator, argue their position, and hope for the best. 
And we know that's not true. We know that the best um, mediation advocates are those that prepare well in advance, are often the smartest person in the room based on the facts and the law, um, and are ready to take on anything and everything that they may confront in the mediation process. A similar trait or related trait has to do with flexibility. Mediation advocates need to be trained to be flexible because it's not enough to be the smartest person in the room. It's not enough to be educated on the facts and the law. In the moment of reading the room, hearing what the mediator has to say, hearing what the other side has to say, one has to be flexible in his or her position and his or her client's position. <clears throat> and the best lawyers are those that can read their audience and adjust on the fly in the mediation process <clears throat> to meet the uh, important uh, needs of the moment. Um, I could go on, I will for a minute and then we'll start to ask some questions shortly. Uh, but lawyers need to be creative. Mediation advocates have a unique opportunity to try and line up potential settlement solutions with their clients' needs and interests. We often describe uh, negotiation in mediation as the art of the possible, the art of the possible. And that speaks to the opportunity to create a solution for your client that is patterned after what they need. We know as litigation advocates and arbitration advocates, when you go into either of those formats, your remedies are prescribed by law. By definition, they're very limited. Maybe they're money-oriented uh, damages, maybe they're specific performance-oriented damages, but they're certainly not the broad range of creative solutions that we often get to in the mediation process. And the best mediation advocates are those that can help the mediator and the other side uh, um, create ideas and potential solutions that navigate the needs of the clients and sometimes transcend what would otherwise be available through a normal or traditional legal process. So don't overlook the importance of creativity. And finally, at least for today's conversation, this idea of patience. Patience on part, the part of a mediation advocate is critical to the process. Mediation is a process. Um, <clears throat> try as I might, after 30 years of mediating every day and seemingly to become pretty good at identifying early on where the parties may be headed, I'm still incapable of rushing the process. And that's because the parties need to go through the process. And the mediation advocates, you as lawyers, need to understand that and help your clients move through the process in purposeful ways, in ways that help them work through emotions, work through an understanding of not just their own position, but the other side's position, to ultimately engage in a negotiation process that might move along at different paces uh, for your client than it does for others in the negotiation. And all of those things take time. And I'm always amazed when those who don't appreciate the mediation process, those advocates who are short on patience, are willing to spend lots of time um, uh, and effort um, uh, on other processes, but not so much on mediation. So why is it that in many countries, it is an issue trying to get lawyers to accept mediation? We know that legislatures and policy makers are, are willing to uh, uh, propose legislation or put in place policies favoring mediation. We know that it's a relatively easy sell for courts to develop mediation programs and court annexed mediation programs. And yet in every country, including the United States, it took time for us to help lawyers become effective mediation advocates to understand and accept mediation really as a new frontier in client representation. My supposition, the reason I think it's challenging for us as lawyers to really accept anything new is there's a fear involved. Many of us have spent decades trying to develop an expertise in certain processes, and it's harder to learn new things as people get on in their profession. They think they know what works, they, they've been successful, and they resist change. That's part of the human dynamic. But there's also an underlying fear. And what do I mean by that? Well, as lawyers, we are used to uh, being in control. So we sometimes fear a process where we don't completely understand our role. Maybe we don't understand the role of our client they're being asked. We're giving up some control to this, this third party, this mediator, and maybe we don't completely understand what he or she is attempting to do. Uh, these sort of fear-based moments 
are all addressed through mediation advocacy training. By better understanding the process, by understanding uh, your role, your client's role, in fact, understanding what the mediator's role is, all of which is going to help you as an effective mediation advocate deliver the kind of results that you're looking for. <clears throat> I want to address another issue, uh, <clears throat> which is that of uh, lawyer income and uh, payment. There are some in different countries that view mediation as a potential threat to their uh, <clears throat> business and the business of law. As I've said already, in the United States, mediation has not jeopardized the practice of law. It has not jeopardized the income of lawyers by and large. And those who become effective mediation advocates attract more and more clients to their profession. So there's actually a competitive advantage over time to becoming a skilled mediation advocate. In some countries, a conversation that's underway is, how do we effectively uh, <coughs> compensate those attorneys who are effective mediation advocates who may not have the same um, opportunity for billable time if a case were to resolve sooner rather than later, but how should they be fairly rewarded and compensated for their activities? And this is an important ongoing conversation. I'm not trying to look past it. I'm just suggesting that in many countries it's being addressed. In the United States, we've been able to try and address it and really move past it as a legitimate concern. So know that there are, is a conversation out there to be had. But in the final analysis, and then I wanna start sort of addressing questions, um, mediation advocacy uh, is sort of a critical moment, I think for many of us, as our career trajectory shifts in a slightly different direction in client representation. Again, doesn't mean that we're not gonna be able to take cases to trial or to arbitration. It simply means we're learning a new skill set, one that allows us to identify interests, to deal with the human element of conflict, to be able to fashion a negotiation plan that's both creative and flexible and still try and deliver winning results for our clients. You know, I'm often amazed that uh, people sort of dismiss mediation by saying, well, I understand mediation. It's really just an opportunity for everybody to compromise. While there are some elements to truth to that, I, I really think it does a disservice to the process and a disservice to you as mediation advocates, because I, I think we can <clears throat> find ways to become better trained, better prepared, and move into this process in a way that allows us to <clears throat> achieve at least partial victories for our clients to uh, navigate the mediation process in ways that uh, are both effective and successful. And in the moment, return us to the best of our profession. Those reasons that brought us to this career path early on. How can we represent our clients effectively uh, in whatever um, um, uh, dispute they may be in and help them move on with their lives in, in meaningful ways? So hopefully I've addressed a number of your sort of thoughts about mediation advocacy and the important role of lawyers in this process going forward. But now what I'd like to do is open it up to questions and try and be more specific in addressing any concerns or thoughts or questions that people might have. Um, Susan, James, have any questions uh, come in from the audience? Um, we've had a couple questions. The first one, which I think you've, you've partially answered, what are the differences and similarities between mediation, arbitration, and litigation? So you've addressed mediation and um, litigation, but maybe you want to talk about arbitration? Yeah. Um, again, arbitration is uh, very close to litigation in that you have decision makers, either an individual arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators, and your job as an advocate is to forcefully present the law and the facts to that panel or to that arbitrator, just as you would a judge in the courtroom. And the goal is that you want to convince that decider of fact and law of the strength of your position. And you want them to agree with you 100%. And you want to do that to the detriment of, your, of your, the opposition. It's what I call kind of a zero sum game or winner take all. <clears throat> and to that extent, uh, the skills required in mediation, uh, I'm sorry, in litigation and arbitration and advocacy are for the most part skills you've been developing and perfecting your entire career. They are skills of, of argumentation, of debate, of preparing responses in the moment, of understanding the facts and the law, of being persuasive in your ability to uh, engage in argumentation. All of those things uh, are, are sort of classic uh, traditional lawyer roles. Mediation advocacy is 
distinctly different, as I said already, but should highlight now. In mediation, the goal is not to convince the mediator of the righteousness of your position, although you will try, I guarantee, <laughs> from years of experience, but it really ultimately comes down to convincing the other side that there is a different perspective on this dispute <clears throat> and perhaps find agreement on certain points in the dispute. And if not, that's okay too. But then moving toward a negotiation where there's elements of collaboration as well as forceful advocacy, there's elements of creativity in looking beyond the boundaries of what would otherwise be available from an arbitrator or judge, really looking for a more holistic solution that truly addresses the needs and interests of the parties. So in that way, they're fundamentally different processes and they require a fundamentally different mindset. That's why we describe a mediator, mediation advocates mindset as being different than a litigation advocate mindset. Um, this next one is really, I think, for both you and uh, James. Is there a re remuneration order that governs the practice of mediation in Kenya and international disputes? James, you want yeah. to start with that? Yeah, and I think in Kenya and in Uganda, there, are, there is a remuneration order, especially for MTI. We have set up our remuneration order. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has got its own remuneration order, and institutions have separate remuneration orders. But what we usually guide people to do is that the issues to do with fees has to be discussed with the disputants before the mediation. It has to be agreed before mediation. It should not depend on the outcome of the dispute because we have a very, very strong code of conduct uh, that regulates that. If your fees would be dependent on the fruits of the mediation, then that's unethical. That's professional misconduct. So issues should be, the issue of fees should be discussed early and agreed upon entirely before the mediation begins. Now, the other thing which I want us to, just wanted to ask, which I'm sure people will be interested in knowing, is that mediation is only confined specifically to family and a few commercial disputes that are referred from court. The experience I have from other countries like the US, the, the Canada, Australia, insurance matters are being mediated. That's not being done in this country. And I think that's where most lawyers are involved in uh, personal injury disputes, uh, in uh, environmental disputes, especially when there's environmental degradation because of the acts of the industry. And also, issues to do with the construction disputes and intellectual property disputes. That's where lawyers practice and we do not have mediation in that. In fact, when people have disputes, they have to find their way to court. And some of these issues sometimes are very technical, uh, even for the courts themselves to be able to comprehend. And they can very well because of subject matter expertise in mediation. I don't know if you can comment on that, how you handle those issues in America. Thank you, James, for highlighting some key issues. Um, going back 35 years in this country, mediation was largely confined to family law matters, some community disputes. There was no mediation in the world of com commercial litigation. That's where I saw the need. I was a commercial lawyer, uh, had clients, some commercial, some individual, but in the world of commercial litigation, as I said already, our standard civil procedure and other pretrial practices did not address uh, um, in a meaningful way what gave rise to the conflict and how to bring about solution. And so my idea, what we put in place was one of the very first mediation companies involving civil litigators, re retired civil litigators. The focus was to being entirely on mediation. And over time, you're right, James, all of those subject matters became appropriate subjects for mediation, construction, environmental, business disputes, banking, insurance disputes, <clears throat> uh, personal wrongful death, intellectual property, employment disputes of all types, class action lawsuits. I could go on, but you get the idea. Pretty much anything that can find its way into uh, civil litigation, uh, there's, an, there's an opportunity for mediation to be effective and successful. And that's what we have found, and that's been the growth industry in the last 30 years in the United States. And I describe my company, JAMS, the company that I mediate with and for, but we're only one of 
dozens and dozens of companies and thousands of mediators, many of whom practice off their kitchen table and now using a Zoom platform or a virtual platform. So the mediation industry is alive and well. Mediators are being paid. Lawyers are being paid for participating in the mediation process. But um, and then this idea of subject matter expertise is an interesting uh, conversation to be had, James, because what we have seen in the development of mediation uh, in the United States uh, is a commensurate or, or at the same time, the development of subject matter expertise in mediators. So many mediators who might specialize in construction or might specialize in intellectual property or might specialize in bankruptcy, technical areas of the law, so they understand the law as it relates to those subjects. And they can converse with lawyers knowledgeably about the law that impacts a particular dispute. And they've trained themselves not just in mediation process skills, but also in the subject matter of the type of dispute that's uh, often before them. And so uh, as lawyers, as mediation advocates, you now have the opportunity to bring your construction dispute to a trained mediator who understands the law of contract and the law of construction. <clears throat> and uh, unlike having to train a judge who may or may not have the interest or the time or the faculty to become experienced in that area of the law, you now have the opportunity to present your case and talk with others in this environment of mediation where everybody speaks the same language and has a, some level of, of understanding. And that's not to be overlooked because many lawyers much prefer the mediation in this day and age for that very reason. Good, I have seen some questions also. Mm -hmm. There is uh, some question from May Ferchi from Uganda. And he says, thank you for sharing your experience. I would like to know if the decision maker is not present in the room because he's an institutional mediation. How do you ensure that the parties available around the table share the discussions and get to, to the pie into the decision makers? Um, I don't know if you understood that question. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think a big part of the specialized mediation advocacy training is to help lawyers understand the process and to walk through each stage of the process. What we do in the training is we deconstruct the mediation process uh, because so many people will say mediation is a fluid process. It sort of doesn't have discernible moments. It just kind of ebbs and flows. And there's an element of truth to that, particularly for those that are not knowledgeable. But the more you learn about mediation, the more you realize there are distinct stages in the process. And that's helpful because it allows you as the mediator and the mediation advocate to prepare for each of those unique and distinct stages. What are you trying to accomplish in the moment? What are those risks and challenges? What are those ethical considerations that are likely to arise? All of that you're more in tune with and able to respond to because you're knowledgeable and you understand that it is a process. And the mediation process has to start and it starts with a convening kind of stage. And so the learning, the training that we go through helps mediation advocates develop a checklist of things to think about in advance of the formal mediation commencing. And so for example, one of those things is uh, a convening conference call potentially with the mediator and the other side to talk about who's gonna to come to the mediation table. What kind of authority do they have? What they, will they bring with them? If it's a, a, some kind of authority that requires sign off by a committee or a board or some higher power, what's that gonna look like uh, as part of the negotiation? All of these things are anticipated. All of these things are discussed in advance. So when you get to the moment of mediation, there is no frustration, there is no, um, a, a, a difficult moment that uh, undermines the progress of the mediation process because it's been contemplated in advance. It's been addressed in advance. And so there's dozens of those kinds of considerations, including the one that was just raised by, our, by the good question. We have a couple more questions. Um, one, first one, it's not very clear on how different jurisdictions are addressing the issue of mediation, taking away work from litigators. So like in the US, what's the convincing position? That's from Gordon. So um, it's a great question. I think what we're seeing in the United States is several things. 
And we're seeing more cases go to mediation before they're filed in litigation, meaning filed with the courts. Lawyers are hired to represent clients just in that informal pre-litigation process. So in fact, there's a whole um, subgroup of disputes that are coming to mediation that otherwise would not be in a process that's a court process because it's pre-suit or pre-filing. Once a case is filed with the courts, then as I've said already, most courts require mediation before they give a valuable resource of time like court trial dates. So there is a greater volume of cases with lawyers coming to mediation than did previously because courts recognize their value. And there's a greater number of cases that come to mediation simply because clients now are more familiar with the process and are more demanding that it at least be um, visited uh, before uh, additional time and money is spent. So there, we're getting a uh, push uh, within the mediation community from lots of different quarters of, 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 the, of mediation and, and why it's successful and how it can be used effectively. Again, I don't wanna overlook the concept that for those of you who may have a case that could be ongoing for two years, and have a contract with a client that allows for a certain amount of compensation for that two years. If the case is resolved in mediation in the first six months through a different contract or understanding that could result in less income. I get that. Now, there are different approaches in the United States, some of which are not necessarily favored by other countries uh, that allow for different approaches. There are uh, um, uh, in the United States, certain cases that are contingency fee cases, meaning lawyers take them on and they only get paid when a case is resolved. It's not a true success-based fee. It just simply means the lawyer gets paid when the case is settled. So we have a whole subgroup of cases that fall under that heading in the United States and lawyers say, yeah, I'd much rather my client be satisfied and happy with a result in the first six months than they will be two or three years <clears throat> down the road and I'll get paid sooner too. So it's a win-win. And there are other kinds of cases like that. I, I do think that over time, a discussion needs to be had in a variety of communities about how to best and fairly compensate lawyers who represent clients efficiently and effectively uh, in a mediation process. <clears throat> you know, you, not only is your client happy, <clears throat> uh, but ultimately, and I've said this already in the United States, particularly an institutional client, an insurance company, a bank, a corporation, when they see you handle their case efficiently, effectively, and bring them a winning result, one they're happy with, and guess what? It takes <clears throat> six months instead of six years, they're gonna give you more cases. And that's what we've seen in the United States. One case goes away, yes, but it's replaced with two or three or a half dozen more because you're viewed to be an effective mediation advocate. Hopefully that addresses the question at least partially. <clears throat> James, there's another question. Um, oh, I'm in regards to to Gordon's question, which was the one about working in different jurisdictions, taking work away. Mediators then have to be lawyers, right? That's the only way that lawyers may benefit from being from mediation, in my view. No, not necessarily. And in fact, if you look at our 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 uh, mediation, uh, the, 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 uh, our mediation ecosystem in this country, 50% are non-lawyers, 50% are lawyers. People have different types of uh, uh, specialties, especially in family mediation, you find that people who have done say, uh, psycho psychology, counseling and psychology are more preferred by the courts in court and net mediation to be handed over these matters too. So it's not a must that you must be a lawyer to be a mediator now. But as lawyers, we can be mediators if we want to. And if we are not able to be mediators, we can be representing our clients in a mediation session. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the thing that the, the, the idea from Lena that mediators then have to be lawyers, I don't think it's right. You can still be a mediator without being a lawyer. And yeah. lawyers can represent their clients in your presence. But if you look at most countries, most lawyers have been encouraged to become mediators because this resolution process begins right at their doorstep. 
So if you have that opportunity of handling that dispute at your doorstep, you, are, you, have, a, you have an advantage. I think that's what you meant. So not necessarily. Most 60% in this country are non-lawyers, mediators, and 50%, 40% are lawyers. And we are, what we are trying to do is as, as much as possible to bring lawyers on board, as many as them as possible, so that at least uh, they, they, if they don't mediate disputes, they can represent their clients in a mediation session. That's the main purpose of this mediation advocacy subject. And it's, it's very true. In, in Countries differ in terms of the backgrounds they prescribe for mediators. In the United States, uh, mediation, advanced mediation at several universities and within the class, there are religious leaders, government leaders, yes, lots of lawyers, some retired judges, but a variety of backgrounds. Uh, Susan and I at Edwards Mediation Academy see people taking our mediation courses who may be HR directors in a bank in Saudi Arabia or uh, in the military, you know, in the United States, police officers, for example. So lots of people will take uh, courses in mediation and mediation uh, advocacy for different reasons. <clears throat> but uh, you're right, James, that not every lawyer uh, is going to be a good mediator. <clears throat> and many lawyers take mediation classes and mediation advocacy classes just to better understand their role and develop their role in the process. I'm amazed when some people come up to me after a mediation, mediation training and say, Bruce, this was fascinating to better understand what you and others sitting, sitting at the head of the table are trying to accomplish. I could never do what you do. I just like representing clients. But now I think I'm a better advocate for my clients because I understand this process. So <clears throat> there will be some of you who continue to or otherwise develop your career path in mediation. That's a different day's conversation because there's a world of opportunity for commercial mediators. There's a world of opportunity for people to develop mediation skills within different organizations to become ombuds or, or uh, um, uh, in-house representatives uh, of companies to deal with conflict. Again, different conversation. Uh, but um, for many of you, it is about as James has just said, learning mediation advocacy so that one can develop their skills in this new, this new frontier of client representation, because it's taking hold, it's taking root throughout the world, as I've said. And we've been in over 30 countries, uh, uh, most of them in person, uh, many of them in the last year and a half online, trying to help lawyers better understand this process and develop their skill set as we see the world changing. We have a few more questions coming in. Are you guys okay if I if I start to uh, ask them? Please. So um, Gordon has a follow up question: Is mediation considered a state practice or federal practice in the United States? As a mediator in California, can you mediate a dispute arising from parties of other states? Good question. So the, one of the real benefits of mediation is its flexibility. It's really divorced. Private, the world of private commercial mediation, which is the company that I've helped create in the world I've been describing, is really separate and distinct from court annexed mediation. If you go to court annexed mediation, the mediators you will work with have largely been trained by and work attendant to the particular court of jurisdiction where the dispute arises. So in the United States, if you had a state court case, you would go to the state court, and if you chose a court annexed mediator, one who was trained in the mediation program, they would be within the state jurisdiction. The same is true in a federal case. Your case was in a federal court, and the court ordered you to go to mediation, and you chose to use a court annexed mediator, it would be a federal court mediator. Now, all of that said, that's separate and distinct from my company. We get calls every day from cases that are in municipalities, in state courts, in federal courts, and as I've said already, many disputes that haven't yet been brought to the court system at all, they're pre-litigation. And as a consequence, free to work wherever. Uh, in the United States, uh, there was a time where there was a question of whether or not mediation was the practice of law, and therefore did mediators need to be certified, did it need to be licensed with bar associations, did it need to be a licensed lawyer? All of that has evolved to the point where uh, almost all jurisdictions say mediation is not the practice of law. Therefore, mediators are free to travel and, and take on disputes wherever. 
And personally, I've mediated disputes over the years in almost all of the 50 states in the United States <clears throat> at one time or another, traveling around, being brought in to uh, help mediate when they didn't have local expertise in the early days, or even more recently when they thought it would require someone with greater skills or experience than what they might have available locally. So uh, at least in the United States, mediators are able to travel far and wide, take on disputes of all sizes, shapes, and, and, and jurisdictions. Um, okay, we have another question. Unfortunately, professional advocates sometimes don't take mediation seriously or too serious to an extent that midi mediation sessions sometimes fail because of that. How do we take out of this? I think that's how do we handle that? Well, those, those challenges that have been presented are sort of two sides of the same coin, meaning by better understanding the mediation process and how your role as a mediation advocate can assist chances of success, one, you learn how to best prepare for that process. So that takes on the challenge of somebody not being prepared for mediation, whether it's not being prepared substantively, not understanding the process, not having sufficient patience to work within the process. Those are all correctable mistakes that come to a mediation advocate through training and experience. Uh, the, the, the opposite is true too, whether I think he said or she said, you know, sometimes it fails because of too much advocacy or too forceful advocacy. Again, it goes back to my initial comments that the first thing you do and you learn as a mediation advocate is to develop a mediation advocate mindset that's slightly different. And in learning that different mindset and learning that you're gonna be saying to your client, I'm gonna be approaching this process slightly differently than you might expect. I, I'm the, I assure you, I am the same uncaged tiger when we get to a courtroom or arbitration. But today you're gonna to see me behaving a bit differently. You're gonna see me trying to work with the other side a little bit more closely to figure out if there's way common goals. And that's going to seem a little different to you, but I assure you it's in your best interest and here's why. So if you train yourself in that mindset, if you train yourself in those accompanying skills, you're not going to be risking being too forceful an advocate in the mediation process and risk the chances of its failure or success. So uh, those are just a couple examples, but there's hundreds of others that are overcome by learning more about mediation advocates role in the process all of which help you become more effective. And by being more effective, by definition, it means avoiding the classic mistakes that lawyers often make that jeopardize the success of the mediation process. Um, hopefully that addresses the question. Oh, one, one last comment. You know, <clears throat> we talk about success in mediation and there is a very common understanding that success is measured by one criteria. Do the parties leave the room on that day with a handshake or a hug or an agreement or a signed agreement in some fashion? And, and that really is the ultimate litmus test of whether or not the process has been successful. But don't overlook the possibility that in many instances, mediation has a lot of benefits short of that ultimate success. Many of the mediations I do that are complex take place over a series of days, sometimes many mediations, sometimes many months. And so while along the way, people might say, gee, on this day, there was no measurable success. By the end of the process, people are kept out of the court system. There's a successful resolution. And it only happened because the mediation advocates were willing to spend the time necessary in earlier stages, earlier days of mediation, so that that could be successful. There's other cases where we're able to narrow the issues in dispute. And so what ends up going to court is a very narrow subset of all the original issues that were in dispute, saving the party's time and money in the process. So there's a lot of different ways to define success. Just be careful about being too one dimensional and thinking it absolutely has to be measured exclusively by a signed agreement coming out of that day's efforts. Okay, we have another question from Helen from Uganda. As a lawyer mediating, and when I identify a legal issue, issue, is it right to separate the parties and give legal advice individually? Again, this will be something that will be ripe for discussion in your mediation advocacy training. There will be different opportunities to share your legal analysis in the mediation context. 
One opportunity is in a joint session. And you may choose at that point to, in an appropriate manner, in front of your client across the table from your adversary, explain to the other side the strength of your legal and factual position in the case. That's the highest, best calling of us as lawyers. We are looking for ways to uh, advocate in clear, convincing, and persuasive ways. Obviously, that's going to be a bit different than maybe you using a private meeting thereafter with your client, maybe with the mediator present, maybe not, but explaining what you just heard on the other side, talking about how the other side could be right. Maybe they're not in your mind, but maybe a lawyer could be, I mean, a judge could be persuaded by them. Finding out what the mediator thinks about the law when he or she is in the room with you privately. Those are two distinctly different moments in mediation, and only two. There are others, but two that could require a different conversation and a different approach to discussing the legal and factual issues in the case. Um, another question. In Kenya, most cases go to the courts before a mediation process is decided upon because various reasons. How is it done in the U.S.? I think you've answered that, but could you touch on that? Well, different countries approach that differently. Yeah, in the United States, cases do go to court for what are called status conferences or case management conferences, where the judge get the lawyers into the same space, whether it used to be in the courtroom, now it's more virtually, to discuss the case, to set up a timeline for a host of various pretrial events, usually discovery of one type or another. And that sort of sets a roadmap for the case in the litigation context, moving from A to Z, moving from case filing to trial date. But along the way, the court will then say, you need to be on a separate track. <clears throat> maybe the court suggests it. Maybe the lawyers say, Your Honor, uh, we've decided that in addition to all of this, we want to attempt mediation. And the court will allow opportunities for that to happen. They'll say, I'll give you 90 or 120 days to get to a mediation process before you need to come back to the court and report your success or not. <clears throat> and so the courts are receptive now to this conversation. They'll build mediation into a timeline uh, that's used to uh, move the case forward and really help the parties find the right tribunal. Courts are careful because they're not in a position to <clears throat> um, suggest or refer cases to a particular company you know, like James, you know, for example, they might know that James is the, the best mediator in Nairobi, but they're not going to be able to usually say go to him, they're going to be able to say, you know, ethically, well, there are commercial mediators out there, you can find out who they are, If you want to go to a court annex program, see my clerk, uh, he or she will give you a list of court annexed and trained mediators, it just depends on the jurisdiction you're in, how the judge will handle that kind of moment. Okay. Is there a legal framework governing the practice of mediation in the U.S.? I understand in Kenya, it remains an unregulated field. So that's really for the two of you. I'll talk about the United States and then I'll ask James to describe kind of what's going on in Kenya. You know, this is almost a topic for a different evening's hour-long conversation. You know, how mediators are certified, how the mediation process is credentialed or not, how it's governed or not. For the, large, uh, uh, for the largest uh, amount of time in the United States, mediation has been unregulated. And it's, it's a longer conversation, but it, it flows from a history of mediation being practiced in family law by therapists, uh, therapeutic scientists, people who weren't lawyers, uh, who aren't lawyers, uh, certainly community mediators who aren't lawyers. So when lawyers kind of came into the process in the world of commercial mediation that I've been describing, there was already a, a, a sort of a lack of compatibility between the historical um, moments leading up to those uh, mediators and mediation training. Those who historically had practiced mediation and were not lawyers didn't want to have certain requirements that required mediators to be lawyers. And so for the most part, that discussion of mediator certification and the context of, of litigation, I'm sorry, of legislation uh, directing the mediation process kicked down the road, and meaning that there was very little that was decided. Over time, there have been certain standards put in place, particularly around mediation ethics, uh, uh, some describing the process, but by and large, 
in the private world of private commercial mediation, it's largely unregulated, both from the standpoint of mediator certification and from the standpoint of what a mediation process really must look like or how it should be handled. But that's, that's just the world of things in the United States. Many developing countries now have the opportunity, developed countries with developing mediation uh, professions, have the opportunity to really start from the ground up, perfect, put in place laws uh, suggesting mediation training and certification, laws suggesting how a mediation process should be handled. But that just unfortunately has not been true in the United States. James, what's your experience? Well, I, I have, I've also looked at other jurisdictions like India and other places. Uh, mediation, uh, usually when it comes to regulation, sometimes they, they move too much into regulating it like uh, a judicial process and it becomes a problem. Yeah. You know, the nature of mediation itself uh, is supposed to be voluntary. Mediation is supposed to be confidential. Yeah. Mediation is supposed to be to result into a win-win solution to the dispute. So when you look at the common tenets of mediation, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issues to do with regulation, it becomes a conundrum at the end of the day, and people start thinking about how to uh, surmount that conundrum. So the issue is that uh, regulation, I think they can regulate court and next mediation but they, they cannot uh, purport to regulate private mediations because when they go into that realm, it means we are putting rules that we regulate something that is supposed to be private, which means the element of confidentiality means when you report to somebody to be able to ascertain whether what you did was ethical or not, you are, still, you are infringing into the confidentiality of the process. So quote next mediation can be regulated, but private mediation is still a long way from getting regulated because of the basic tenets of the mediation process itself, if it has to be made. Even quota next mediation in these countries is, uh, even in Uganda, I think it's mandated, it's court mandated. It means courts issue orders and we have to comply with orders and there are consequences if people do not attend the court process. That's in as far as courts are concerned. You can't do the same thing with private mediation because the moment you mandate it, there are a number of things that you're going to offend as far as the natural the tenets of mediation are concerned. So it's still a debate that is out there that people are still uh, discussing about. I, I saw that debate in South Africa. I've seen the debate in Egypt. I've seen the debate in Nigeria and in Ghana. They are still talking about it on the issues of regulating private mediations. And they, they seem not to agree. And it's because of the nature of the mediation itself. Court and next mediation can be regulated and they can have a very strong uh, code of conduct. The other issue is that we can, people can form credentializing organizations where uh, there are people who register into specific organizations. Like in, in East Africa, we have the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators. This Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators has got a code of conduct and we, re, we, we register mediators from uh, across East Africa. And we know that if an institution is looking for a credible mediator on a specific code of conduct, they can come to us we can recommend a mediator and take responsibility should anything go wrong about that mediation. That, that's the kind of guarantee that we give. And therefore we do what we call self-regression as private mediators. But institutionalizing the process of private mediation, I think will bring will send it into a number of difficulties because of its nature. Those are great observations, James. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. The best organizations have code of conduct. They have the ability to uh, uh, refer experienced uh, professional mediators, and they serve a, a valuable role in the uh, development of the mediation community as a whole. Uh, I also agree that this idea of folks legislating private mediation is fraught with problems, because for the most part, legislation is proposed by people that have a certain special interest. For example, they might say, we don't like the fact that there's confidentiality in these mediation outcomes. So let's propose a law that says mediation uh, settlement agreements can't contain a confidentiality clause. Well, obviously that shows that people just don't understand the mediation process and they're trying to make laws that impact it. So by and large, every time a, a law comes across uh, 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 my desk, 
as a proposal and people ask me to comment on, it usually reflects somebody that doesn't really understand the mediation process per se and has some kind of a specific agenda they're trying to, to get across. Mm -hmm. And let me, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, there's something from Gloria. She's talking about mm -hmm. how do you deal with difficult lawyers who participate in mediation? I recently read a quote on ex-mediation matter, but none of the lawyers wanted to change the initial stand. We couldn't agree on anything and they prefer that they wait for the court orders. Now, Gloria, with my practice, I have seen where lawyers come and sit in a mediation session. And when we are almost agreeing, they pick their clients and leave. And they say they have not been paid their fees. And, uh, it becomes a chaotic because they, they assume we are settling too quickly when the issues to do with our fee has not been settled. So the purpose of this mediation advocacy, and I think it's come at the right time in, this, in East Africa, is to be able to bring those lawyers and make them allies in our practice. If we want to make the process easier, if we want mediation to grow in East Africa, <clears throat> the intention of inviting Edwards Mediation Academy to partner with us is to ensure that we can bring many lawyers on board. Because when we have many lawyers on board and they are collaborating with you mediators, they, your job will be much easier. These, those incidences will be less and less every day and they will all disappear. So that's the reason why we have brought this very, very important topic on mediation advocacy. Please James, James, let me add, I, I don't want to be negative in this because it really is a positive message we're trying to deliver. But there are those in the United States, those lawyers that just were too old or too stubborn or didn't want to learn new things, and they got left behind. I mean, I have lots of stories of insurance companies that said, um, my lawyer told me that uh, mediation wasn't for our company, and they just uh, wouldn't use it. So quite literally, we came uh, on a Friday, asked them to pack up all their files representing our uh, insurance company, and we transferred those to a law firm that had a different, more progressive perspective. And over time, uh, even some of those initial lawyers that didn't uh, uh, go with mediation and lost clients as a result, many of them ultimately came around. And for, for, candidly, I smile because some, in some instances, years later, some of those same people that tried to resist mediation and lost clients in the process, years later, when they got closer to retirement age, they sent me their resume and said that they wanted to become mediators because they saw the wisdom of the process. So everybody comes to decisions in their own way, in their own time. But as lawyers, just appreciate that your clients may, in fact, see the wisdom of these decisions very soon. And the sooner you can be prepared to sort of not just follow along, but actually get out ahead of them and advise them appropriately, the better, the more competitive you will be as measured by uh, others within your profession. We have another um, another question. In Tanzania, it is unfortunately limited to labor disputes and only to 30 days. Ooh, any advice? So mediation is, is limited to labor disputes and only 30 days. When I was in Tanzania uh, last, I visited Tanzania, and I even found out that Tanzania has a commissioner for mediation. They have even a person who is in charge of mediation. There's a time when I came to train a labor officers in Dodoma. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue is that we need to develop much in East Africa and as far as uh, uh, this uh, mediation is concerned. I think what we need to do, the first uh, pilot program in mediation was done in the High Court of Dar es Salaam when they wanted to introduce a uh, court and mediation. And I think the, uh, the, the lawyers and the other professionals in Tanzania, what they need to do is simply to open up and get more people trained. If you want people to be convinced and to support your cause, aim at training the court staff, the judges and the magistrates, aim at training other professional policy makers. Because if you start with policy makers, then these are the same people that will assist you to put these systems in place. MTI East Africa, we are ready to assist Tanzania as much as possible to have these processes working in. And we'll also work together with the uh, Edwards Mediation Academy to bring the mediation advocacy to Tanzania. The, the only best way to do it is to train the public, to train the policymakers, and also train the lawyers in mediation advocacy so they can work together in growing the mediation industry in Tanzania. So is, I know you have a good basis, and there's a lot we can do by opening up that space. So it's away from the leper 
section only. We can go into manufacturing, we can go into medical, we can go into insurance, we can go to community and commercial and ensure that mediation spreads over. And that's, I think, the same thing that uh, some people are working for in Uganda. Uganda is doing a good job. In fact, I was there. I found them ahead. I had uh, an interview uh, in Uganda at KT, uh, uh, MTV Uganda, and we were with the registrar of the Supreme Court. They have gone to the extent of even mediating some uh, matters. So these guys are ahead. So then we can develop it also on the other side at the same time. So in Tanzania, be ready. We are here. <laughs> Bruce will be coming. We will teach you. Uh, we will be available to teach you so that we can grow the mediation in the legal profession and also in the private sector, including the policymakers. Uh, again, great comments. Uh, to, it's a question of expanding people's vision through education and understanding. And as James has suggested, uh, sometimes that expands. We've been talking today about private mediation, the commercial world, and that's sort of the first and next frontier. But in many countries that we work, we're also expanding the teaching of mediation to criminal prosecutors for use in uh, victor offender uh, programs and in, in, you know, negotiating uh, plea bargains. Uh, we're expanding mediation training side of uh, litigation entirely into governments so they can use it in policy for um, As many of you know, mediation skills are now being taught to school children. Uh, for use in uh, uh, navigating playground disputes uh, between their peers. So at a very early age, people can better understand this process. So in answer to the question, many countries may have limited experience with this, that's fine. It's about expanding their vision in the first instance, and then perhaps most importantly, giving them experience with the process, ideally giving them a successful experience with the process. Because once people actually go through this process and see it in, in action and see how it addresses people's needs and interests in real time and hopefully in a shorter time than might otherwise be the case, they become true converts. And my 35 years of experience uh, uh, shows that there are people who once trained and educated and experienced in mediation, they become lifelong converts for their companies, uh, and, and for their mediation advocates uh, moving forward. Good. So I can see somebody made an, an, uh, uh, a comment here that in Uganda, mediation is limited to 60 days. The same thing, court and next mediation in Kenya is limited to 60 days, but you can also seek uh, extension of time. So some of these uh, disputes that are referred from court, they do not have a very complex structure. They can easily be handled even within hours, but you are given time so that you can hold your change sessions on a different dates, caucus on different dates, so that parties are able to be given time to think over their issues. Because once there's a settlement, especially in our court and expedition in Kenya, that settlement is converted into a, a court order and uh, or a, uh, some form of a, a judgment, and there is no appeal. There is no appeal against the court order or a judgment that emanates from a mediation agreement. That is the reason why people are given adequate time to think over the issues before they commit their, 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 their issues on paper. So that, I think the same thing to you, 60 days is also valid. The same, same uh, court and expedition program here in Kenya, uh, 60 days. I don't know what happens in Uganda. But what I'm trying to, to do at the end of the day is to see how you can, we can assist each other as East Africans and uh, grow this process. And we, we will get there. And we have partners who can work very closely with us to ensure that uh, we, we get the, to reach that particular point. Is, is there any question? We have not seen Susan. Any question? I don't. I believe we've responded to everyone um, yeah. on the Q&A, yes. OK. If there's any questions that we haven't responded to, I'll make sure I'll go through. And anything else we'll send out by email to all the registrants. Um, Oh, one just came in. Oh, this is the one that we you. We yeah, it's that study days in in, in 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 Tanzania. We can see that. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll probably give this opportunity to uh, Ed, Edward, uh, Susan, then Edward uh, to give their closing remarks. But before we do that, I I'm, uh, we I just want to announce that we've started our registration tonight. We'll start our registration for the purpose of training in mediation advocacy. You can register online because the program will be done online. It will be for a period of uh, two months. 
and I think you can get more information on the relevant websites. I think uh, Susan will talk more about that. So let me give this opportunity to Susan to say something, and then uh, Bruce will say something before we close our session today. Susan. Yes, thank you, James. So as James said, we're gonna be opening up registration for our mediation advocacy course. I will send an email out to everybody in the next few days with the recording of this webinar and also information on where you can get, where you can register. Um, it's through the MTI East Africa site. So, um, and I will also respond to any questions that we have not approached, we have not been able to answer here. So with that, Bruce. Well, if there's one takeaway from tonight's conversation, it's to understand and appreciate that lawyers are a critical stakeholder group, in fact, are essential to the effective implementation of mediation, uh, regardless of country or regardless of the, the type of mediation we're talking about. And as professionals, we've seen our profession change, those of us who have been around for decades, and mediation is uh, perhaps one of the more fundamental and profoundly significant changes uh, in the legal profession. In terms of offering lawyers a unique set of skills to advance their clients' interests, mediation is here to stay. It's a question of whether lawyers can uh, appropriately train themselves, educate themselves, and their clients as to the process so that they can successfully work within the mediation context and still deliver successful winning results for their clients. But that requires training and education. It requires an open mind to learning new skills and working people, working with people like James and ourselves to, to try and come up uh, to speed with those new skills. So I welcome you to this new stage of your learning journey and we stand ready to help you in whatever way we can. Thank you very much. Uh... Bruce, and thank you very much, Susan. Uh, there are so many people who wanted to join, but there's a problem with the network. They have really experienced um, network problems. I've received so many messages. Uh, okay. Almost 120 people are never, were not able to, to join this uh, session. Mm -hmm. But you know, we experience that problem in this part of the world because our internet sure. is not very reliable from some quarters because of technical issues and the rains. Yeah, so many, there's a lot of rain elsewhere. So therefore it interferes with our yeah. internet session. But those people who are not able to join, they can get information about registration. So for that matter, I think lawyer, lawyers and non-lawyers, we can work together in building mediation in East Africa. So we'll work together and sure as get as many lawyers as possible on board and then the rest of other professions. So we can work together to ensure that mediation is a success in this part of Africa. Thank you very much for attending and I uh, hope to see you in the class. I also be joining the class with you so that we learn together on how to represent our clients during a mediation session. Thank you very much. Thank you people from Uganda. The president of Uganda, I think is uh, Uganda Law Society is here. Thank you very much for attending. The president for the Law Society of Kenya, Robbie Branch is here. Thank you for attending. And the president for Uganda Law Society is here. Thank you for attending. Thank you very everybody and see you in class. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.